Welcome back. Today we're going to be going over a game between Shi Yue and Mi Yu Ting, both Chinese professionals. I personally am really fond of Shi Yue. I discovered him earlier this year and just really like, for especially for a Chinese player, typically Chinese players have more of a fighting style, but Shi Yue has a really patient, calm approach to his games that I really enjoy watching. And there's a lot of interesting stuff in this game, and particularly we're going to be going over uh, how to evaluate Joseki. There's a, it's not really a new Joseki pattern, but it's something that's very much in vogue right now in the upper left corner, and we'll be kind of analyzing how to look at the end result and judge what, who got the better end of the deal, or if it was an even result. And the other thing I want to go over in this game is crosscuts, because crosscuts are complicated, and if we understand them better, then we can use them more effectively in our games. So let's get started here. Black, which is uh, Mi Yu Ting, is black, starts in the upper right with a uh, 3-4 stone, and we have kind of a, this looks like an old, old Japanese game from the 1800s with everyone opening at the 3-4 point and no star, star point stones. White approaches. Uh, black makes a pincer, which also extends from the enclosure in the upper upper right. And uh, Shi Yue kind of sidesteps this pincer by establishing a position on the bottom. This is kind of a neat technique. I thought this was kind of neat to jump out over here, and then when black comes in to separate, instead of continuing in the corner, just to create this uh, framework on the bottom. And uh, you could see this stone, you know, is this is kind of a similar idea in some respects to creating like a mini Chinese formation is that we're, we're going for a framework. We're not trying to settle immediately. We're leaving a lot of possibilities open. Black approaches in the upper left. And this is the Joseki that I wanted to go over. Uh, this, uh, this pincer is definitely popular these days. Uh, I think it's rather severe. Uh, it's kind of limiting Black's options in a lot of ways. If we, if we pincer further away, there's room to establish a base. Uh, and then this is also threatening to connect underneath for white. And um, also, typically in this position, um, if this black stone were not here, and Black was looking at this uh, you know, three-line um, extension from the third to the fourth line. Typically, the places that we would look at to invade would be either A, for a deeper invasion, B, for a shoulder hit, or C, as a sort of reducing maneuver. So, typically, the point at D is not as effective. Uh, you will see it in some games, depending on the situation. We always have to look at the whole board. But typically... A, B, and C are the three points that you should first look at in this formation. Just like on the bottom, you know, if we were looking at the bottom, uh, if we wanted to invade, we would play at D, and if we wanted to reduce, we could play at E or F, depending on the board position, to uh, sort of press white down or limit the, uh, the amount of territory and influence white is getting from this formation. So, basically, um, this uh, low pincer kind of puts the black stone in an awkward location. This is one of Black's options, and White's next move is really popular right now, and it's this two-space jump along the top. There are other options. Uh, White can Hane at A, but uh, this is this is just this. We're seeing this a lot, and the actual full continuation of this Joseki uh, is is definitely something. Just when I was looking through pro games to find something that I wanted to cover. I think I went through about 10 of them, and I saw this Joseki like four times, and these are all games from the last two weeks, so this is happening a lot recently. Uh, black comes down, which puts a lot of pressure on the white stone at A, and so white kind of has to respond to this, and this is what we're seeing right now, is uh, white is usually descending like this. It's also possible for white to play a diagonal move at E18, but this is, this is the most common response. Now, Black could continue in the corner at C, but that leaves this glaring weakness at A, which if white is able to slide to A, it destroys black's um, shape on the outside. 
So typically what we see is black will now jump down here. And this also, just like this, um, you know, headbutt against the white stone, is also pretty much sente, because while white could turn at A, then the attack on the B stone will be fairly severe. Uh, black can play at C and look to link up either underneath or on top. So most of the time in this situation, uh, we see white extending. It's also possible to play the uh, just two space extension on the third line, but if we look at the white stones at A, B, and C, it seems like we can go for more. If we were just to play on the third line, this seems like it would be really flat on the left side for white. So if there were a black stone at A, for example, it would be better to just play the low extension because uh, other because the weakness of the fourth line move is black can play at D this kind of knight's move underneath the fourth line stone. But with all these white stones on the bottom, white's not afraid of fighting here. So if black wants to come in and start something, white's going to be very happy about that. And now black goes in and takes the corner. And this is a really nice corner shape right here. And now these three white stones on the top are really weak. Just to show you uh, what could potentially happen here is... Um, well, white is going to have to extend again, so white comes out one more time. But there's weaknesses right in here, because, for example, um, just to show something kind of crude, but if black plays like this, black can link up to this stone. This is not probably a sequence that would actually be played, but, you know, just, this gives you an idea of the Aji that's there, and this is why white really does have to uh, make this extra two-space extension along the top to K17. So if we go back, uh, we'll see the next move, uh, black tanuki, so the, the local pattern is over. So how do we evaluate this result? Uh, whenever we're looking at a Joseki pattern, it helps to start with who played there first. White played there first in this case, so white should get a better result when black approaches. Now once black approaches, there's lots of options. White plays this pincer. We go through the pattern that we've just seen. <clears throat> and now we know black plays down in the lower left after this move, so what did each side get? Well black got the corner, and white got positions on both sides. Uh, the other thing that's important to note is black is not sealed in here. And these are some things to think about when you're evaluating Joseki. Number one, did one player get sealed in? A lot of times we see corner results where one player will give away a huge corner, like a 20-point corner, like all the way out, you know, you know, to here somewhere, you know, it's like black will end up with you know, stones all the way out like this, just enclosing a massive corner area, but white will completely seal black in on the outside. And a lot of times that result will be good for white if it's thick enough and there's not too much black aji, if there's no cutting points, if there's no way to escape. And that's because, well, you know, a corner like this would be huge. You know, this is, what did I set up here? Six. What, six by six? This would be like a 36 point corner. But if white just has stolid stones all the way around this, the result would be good for white. Because even though black gets a huge corner in like 36 points, we'd, a lot of us would be like, oh my goodness, like that's, that's so frightening. The, if, there's no, if white's thick on the outside and there's no way for black to get out or cut, the thing to pay attention to is that the black stones are not impacting the flow of the game moving forward, whereas the white stones are. And that can mean a lot. Thickness can be very valuable because it continues to impact the flow of the game. But in any event, we notice that right now, the black stones in the upper left are not fully enclosed, so that's good for black. But it's also generally thought that if you're able to develop on both sides while your opponent takes the corner, that that's good for you. So in that sense, this is definitely, there's something to be said for white's position, because white's gotten development on both sides of the corner, and uh, black has just taken a few points back uh, in the upper left, probably about, looks like nine, maybe ten points, give or take, uh, which is really not that big. The other thing, though, is that 
this was White's corner to begin with, and now Black is the one who's taken the territory. White's developed on both sides, but Black also gets to take Sente, and that's the other thing that you should think about. Number one, did you get totally sealed in? Number two, were you able to develop on both sides? These are both things that are really going to impact the evaluation of the result. And number three, who gets Sente? And also, whoever played first should normally get a better result. And in this case, I think the result is pretty much even. White definitely gets more, uh, if we, even if we assume that black can destroy this area right around here. Uh, white's still getting, you know, at least five points of territory here, at least five points of territory here, and white's uh, left side stones coordinate very well with the stones along the bottom. So notice now that if we get into a fight in the lower left, then this stone is going to be very important in terms of uh, if black tries to run out, what white can do in terms of uh, count uh, attacking this stone. So even though black took the corner from white, even though black played their second, and black got sente, even though black played their second, white got to develop on both sides, and particularly on the left side, got to create a formation that works very well with their framework on the, along the lower side. So those are some things to think about when you're evaluating the result from a Joseki. And here we can see white is playing very aggressively, uh, leaving this cut to uh, play on the vital point, keeping black from making a minor extension, because white could also consider to do something like descend here, black could play something like this, and now we're getting into just kind of a standard, uh, if you study the, the Chinese shape, um, this is kind of a standard pattern, and the thing with professionals is that everybody knows where this is going, and it's not very interesting. So white tries for a little bit more by playing here instead of in the corner, and note that this does give black the opportunity to, to play here and get a little bit of a base, but black is going to be a little more active and focus on the outside, because like I said, one thing about evaluating a Joseki, if black does play here, and even if white plays something just out here to keep black, uh, maybe here or here, um, to keep black from escaping and totally seal in, this is still fine for white. Uh, because, like I said, these white stones are going to impact the flow of the game while black is just getting, oh, I don't know, maybe 10 points in the corner, which is not really that big. But in this case, black does not want that to happen. So black comes out, forces white to come back, and now black is playing all these leaning moves to try and get some uh, shape on the outside. So this is a, this is a neat technique to kind of come out with good shape, and uh, and this is not the panuki that we talk about when we say a panuki is worth 30 points. This is a co-shape uh, that's, you know, helping black to get good shape and escape. So white connects, and uh, we can see black is moving out, you know, pretty well, using all these forcing moves uh, on the lower side and the uh, top. But black still has no base. And now, th now this is getting a little complicated. Coming out here and cutting off these three stones from these four on the inside, it's definitely a knife fight now. So basically, white presses once, because if black ignores this, then these two stones will be captured. And if black were to allow that, it would be why play this move in the first place. And then white has to come back and cut off the two stones in the, in the corner to make sure that these five stones don't die. Uh, black continues, sort of. Now, the upside for black is that now this white group is fairly weak as well. So, this is more of an even fight now between the weak black stones at one and the weak white stones at two. But notice that in order to make the, the white group at two weak, black had to give up these two stones in the corner, which is pretty big. Like, we can see the territory down here is definitely good, a good size. So, there was a bit of an exchange there.
and now white kind of links up all of these stones. So this is this is kind of a neat sequence for white because up until white plays this linkage right here, we're not really sure what we're doing with this stone. But now it's become a vital reinforcement for a weak group. And this is the type of thing that professionals love, and that's just really beautiful to see, is that they're using all of their stones together all of the time, which is, you know, the, the, the more we can learn from and emulate that, the better we as amateurs get, just trying to use everything that we have on the board. Here Black says, you know what, this white group's getting some influence projecting down this way. I really don't want white to invade somewhere around, you know, A, and make the B stone weak, because then the B stone's going to have to jump out, and if we have this weak stone here jumping towards our weak group here, well, we all know what happens when you have two weak groups running towards each other, white gets, to, or your opponent gets to attack both. So this, uh, this jump up to uh, P12 is well-timed, uh, keeping black from uh, becoming really busy trying to manage multiple weak groups. On the other hand, it gives white a chance to uh, establish a bit of a base for this white group. But establishing, well, and establishing this base, and notice it's not done yet, <laughs> because black could come back and capture this one stone, but that would be gote. That would be a little slow. And it does give white a little bit of uh, shape along the edge and uh, in the center. We could see a white move at A in a point of emergency to probably create an eye. Uh, it would be difficult for black to uh, remove this, uh, this eye effectively. But white limits uh, black's potential on the top. Uh, now that black's got this uh, smaller framework, uh, an extension along the top would be pretty big. Uh, black could consider shoulder hits and attachments and caps and lots of other things. But uh, white's basically saying now this group is very solid and it's really going to limit black's potential in the center. And really, at this point in the game, we see that we have a large white area, a large black area, and black's got a little bit on the bottom and a little bit up here, but it's pretty obvious that white's area is bigger than black's. So given that white also has the upper side, most likely, unless something crazy happens, it seems like this game is going okay for white at this point in time. But it's black's move. And, like I said, you know, Black's going to say, no, I don't want you to get eyes here, because that move could be something that works for White in the future. And now Black's going to invade over here. And much like before the stone at A is played, this is kind of looking at linking up underneath or on top. It's, it's, whenever you're invading, it's good to have multiple ideas. Black could also just come out at B, could think about connecting at C. Uh, there's some possibilities of even, you know, if we had a few forcing moves and we're maybe going to get an I for sure over here, maybe even sliding to D to get a second I as a possibility. And whenever you're invading, it's always good to have options. You don't want to invade and only have one way to go, because A, that makes it easy on your opponent. They just have to stop one thing. And in Go, if we only have to do one thing, like if a group only has to live, it's probably going to live. If we only have to reduce, probably going to be able to reduce, you know. Ideally, you want your opponent to have to make a tough decision between two important things. And if you can get into a mindset where you're always trying to do multiple things with your moves, it makes it really hard for your opponent to make decisions. And particularly, if you're playing timed games, you're not playing like a correspondence game on the Dragon Go server or OGS, if you're playing quick games with only five minutes thinking or ten minutes thinking, making your opponent make tough decisions consistently can really make you a lot stronger. White says, I'm going to cover. Black says, okay, well, I'm going to, if you're not going to let me get out, I'm just going to connect back. And this is why it's good to have options when we invade. And now white comes out, and now this black group is definitely under attack. Before this move, we weren't really behind enemy lines, per se. We are getting kind of close, maybe, but this is a long distance between this white stone here and this white stone here. Now, the C and B stones right here, we can tell this black group is definitely coming under attack. Uh, so, black starts to play, and right here, we have black counterattacking. So black's not just going to say, oh no, Oh no, I'm under attack. I better I better jump out. 
I was going to say, you know what? This white group down here, the white group at A, is not alive yet. So let's counterattack. Let's not just run away. Let's, let's do something active. So black attaches, white hanes, black crosscuts. So this is the second thing I wanted to focus on in this game was crosscuts. And right here, white has to make a decision. You know, where do we want to extend? What do we want to do? So one thing um, about crosscuts is we typically say the, the sort of generic advice, if you will, is when in a crosscut, extend. But then the question is, extend from which stone and extend in which direction? That still gives us multiple options. And in this case, white extends up. Uh, part of the reason is that with these stones over here, it could get really hairy if white just says, oh, you know, I want to make sure, I really want to make sure that I have an eye here. Uh, because then I can go back and capture this stone. Um, I'll definitely be alive. In this case, um, black could actually consider doing something kind of along uh, these lines. And obviously, you know, white can come back and capture this one stone. But if white tries to push out through these stones, it's not going to go uh, well. So for example, black could play here. If white plays here, this is Atari. White has to come back. And you can see now this black group is just super thick. So we were trying to attack these stones. <clears throat> and what happened? Uh, well, white ended up living almost accidentally. But black A is now completely alive connected basically through the whole board here, and just built a giant wall towards the active area of the board. And it's really important when you're, when you're evaluating a result, if you're building a wall towards the active area of the board, that's worth a lot. You know, sometimes, you know, there, sometimes a player will build a wall, but it'll be a wall that's like facing a really strong formation. In this case, black could think, oh, well, maybe I can actually, you know, um, you know, build something in here. You know, black could play shoulder hit at A, if white responds, could attach at B, and now it's looking like, wow, this area in here is looking really big. So white's going to have to do something about this right away. Whereas what did white really get? White got like, you know, three points of territory, plus, you know, maybe for the entire group, like five or six. Six points compared to a black wall facing the active area of the board is a very good result for black. So white can't just, uh, you know, let the stone get pushed around by black. So white extends here. Now, the other thing to notice is that when we extend from a crosscut, we're threatening a ladder. In this case, white's threatening a ladder at A. Now, obviously, there's black stones over here, so it's not like this ladder is working right now. But we could think, let's see. Yeah, white could play a move um, at B as a ladder breaker. And then if black escapes by playing at A, then white can descend. So for example here, let me just show the full sequence. Uh, let's say black now decides to jump out. Uh, white could play something like this, and now black has a very tough decision. If they respond to protect the side, now this ladder is working. So boop, 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 white plays there, extends, and that's Atari and captures. So this is this would not be good for black to give white a panuki right here. This group would instantly become alive, it would be super strong, and we can then see that there's going to be a really vicious attack against these stones, black stones in the center. On the other hand, if black plays something, um, go back to here, uh, if black escapes from the ladder, well, white will play here, and now notice that the group at A has just become really weak. And again, it's always a problem to have two weak groups on the board because we can see that any time that white strengthens the sea stones, it's going to be attacking both of these groups. So white's essentially doing two things every time they play in the center, whereas black is going to have to go back and forth and try to save both. So this is important. You know, we can't leave this situation just hanging like this. But black forces over here, and then comes back to play this Atari, which prevents the ladder, and connects. And now white is going to come out and, and attack with the stones, the two stones in the center, attack this black group over here. So again, we get into this, and here we have another sort of crosscut situation. 
And what we'll see is in this case, white's going to Atari, because this is going to help uh, this white group in the center, which is, you know, not super strong. It is attacking this black group. You know, this is, this is getting into complicated infighting. But another thing to note, when black extends here, we immediately have to look at the ladder that starts at A. Because if this ladder is working for black, then this extension is sent A, and white needs to do something to save the stone right here at B. And in this case, yes, we can see the ladder slides right by the white stones over on the side and hits the black stones here, so this ladder is working. So this extension is sent A. It's just, these are the steps that you have to go through when you, you know, when you make a move and you're in close combat. Can I capture it in a ladder? Okay, now let's just say for the sake of, you know, for the sake of theory, that there's actually a white stone, like, right here. So obviously now this ladder is not working, but black has another very important question, which is can I catch it in a net? Because if the question of that is yes, then this move was also sente, and white will have to respond. And you should definitely read out for yourself and figure out if this net move is working. Can black hound white all the way back down and capture it? And you should do that because practicing your reading makes you faster and gives you more confidence. And ladders and nets are the best place to start because they're just fundamental ways of capturing stones. So since we know the ladder's working here, white has to make a move. <clears throat> and again, what is this move doing? It's threatening a ladder. And you know, this is just, this should be so instinctual when you're analyzing a position. It's like, did that move threaten a ladder? Did that move threaten a net? And is that ladder working? So in this case, we can see, yes, this ladder is running into this white stone, so yes, that ladder is definitely working. So black has to do something. Black just can't let these two stones go at this point. I mean, that would probably result in this big group down here at A dying, which is not acceptable. So black turns to prevent the ladder. And so we can kind of see, even in this complicated fight, you know, in, even in this really complicated situation, you know, where, okay, black cuts here. Okay, so now black has a weak group at A, has a weak stone at B, white has a weak stone at C, a weak group at D, and we're not even 100% sure if the group at E is alive yet. So, I mean, if you were just to, you know, walk into a room and see this board position, you know, it might take you a little bit to figure out all that's going on. But really, we can see that the players kind of have to make you know, from, so from this position, this is kind of forced. White has to do something to protect the A stone. White extends. Black has to do something to protect the A group. So black turns. So a lot of times, professionals aren't reading out necessarily 20 moves in advance and considering all the different variations. What they're seeing is that I'm going to have to save this stone. I have to save the A stone. How am I going to do that? I'm going to threaten a ladder against Black's group at A. And Black says, okay, I'm going to have to save the A group. How am I going to do that? I'm going to turn and threaten to uh, capture these white stones at A. So in a lot of senses, these sequences are more forced than you may immediately realize. And the easiest way to tell that they're forced is to look at the ladders, because the ladders are threatening to capture very important stones. And this is, again, just why, you know, it's really vital if you want to become strong to get good at reading ladders. Because even though they might be 20 moves long and go across the whole board, they're unbranched, they're easy to read, and they happen so often. Or not so much that an actual ladder will happen, but the threat of a ladder happens so often that you're going to need to be able to read them quickly in order to evaluate positions. So here again, we, these are these are more complex moves that uh, you know should not be lightly imitated. But if you get good at reading ladders and you can read out a twenty move sequence, then analyzing these variations becomes that much easier for you in your own games. And particularly too, like if we're playing these five minute you know with three thirty second Bayoyomi periods on KGS or whatever Go server is your favorite. You know, being able to read these ladders quickly allows us to make valid positional judgments really fast. And that's going to make us a lot stronger. So, 
here we have a little bit of an exchange, and this looks really ugly for white, but there's a few things about this position to note. One, uh, these black stones on the outside um, are not particularly strong as long as the cutting point here at A remains. Secondly, white is also threatening to start a co at B to connect all the stones and become alive. So there's two things that black needs to worry about. And because of the cutting stone at C, there is, you got it, a thread of a ladder at D to capture the two black stones. Now the question is, does that ladder work? And you should be able to read that out fairly quickly and tell me yes or no. And in this case, the answer is yes, because black has to jump out to prevent that from happening. So that allows white to cut here. So even though white made this really ugly shape in the center, it's okay because it's threatening to do so many different things. It's threatening to capture these stones. It was, now we're threatening to capture these stones, these stones, and we still have the emergency co at D if we need uh, a last ditch effort to save these stones and connect all of our uh, groups together. So this is, this is looking pretty good for white right now. And again, what does this move threaten? It threatens to start a ladder. And we can see that this ladder is working. So we can, we can tell already, not maybe the exact move that white's going to play, but white has to stop this ladder from happening. Because if black captures these two stones, then the group at B is alive, and the group at C is alive, and black will be thick in the center. So that's too much for white to bear. So we can see right away, you know, this, this is not a hard thing to understand. Black threatens a ladder, white has to respond. And again, we get into more infighting. The, we've got this white extension here. And the interesting thing about this white extension is that uh, it's threatening this uh, move at A, which threatens a snapback It's at B. So black is going to have to prevent that. And then white jumps out. And here, there's more threats to capture. Black comes back to capture one stone. Now black is alive down here, but <clears throat> uh, white's you know, connected through here with one group of stones and uh, is then connecting back to this you know, established corner group to make sure that nothing is getting captured. Black has some forcing moves. Uh, after the Atari here, Black has to come back and say, okay, now these are definitely eyes, you know, otherwise uh, White could wedge at A and then start this co, which would be annoying. And uh, White comes back to capture the two stones. Now Black has to care for this group, so he's going to use forcing moves along the top to do so. But notice in this whole sequence that, well, really, neither side is making much territory, to be honest. But you know how we evaluated the situation earlier and it seemed like white was doing pretty well with the group on the top in the large corner? Black's gotten in a little bit of reducing, but has also had to solidify the territory on top. It still seems like this is working reasonably well for white. And now uh, this is uh, actually an Atari on these stones, so black has to decide how to respond. Uh, and when you're, another thing about this type of co-shape and a lot of times people have a lot of difficulty evaluating, you know, whether to fight a co or what the best solution is. Because normally in this situation, we have a lot of options. We can connect at A. That sometimes works. You know, we just, white's threatening this co, so we just fall back and connect. But notice that that would, that A is our second I in this shape. White would extend at D and kill us just outright. And there would be, and white wouldn't even have to fight this co if we filled it A. So that's not possible. Secondly, uh, <clears throat> we could just outright fight the co. But the question is, what would black potentially gain from fighting this co? And in this case, the answer is that you know, if black says, okay, yeah, let's let's fight this co. Uh, I'm gonna go. Where's a good, you know, I'm gonna find a good co threat. You know, we're going to. Um, what would be something that would work here? Uh, oh, here, black turning here would be really big because when black captures here um, at B2, 
then these white group over here would also be captured. And white says, okay. And then black would capture the co. Notice there's no follow-up for black here. Like there's no way, uh, you know, the one thing black could do is if white played something, black could ignore and maybe escalate the co a little bit. But this is really, now this is like fighting a two-step co for black. This is not really a good idea. So essentially all black can gain here is coming back to fill the co, and this is essentially a half point endgame co for black, okay? So black has very, very little to gain. On the other hand, if black does make a co threat and white decides to ignore, notice that these stones are in Atari, so white can capture here, and this would kill the entire group. Uh, in this case, it would be a little tricky because if black comes here, white would come down. Ah, uh, no. It seems that um, black would actually run out of liberties before this white group would. So this would be a collapse for black. Because uh, we can see that this black group only has two liberties, and this white group has four. So uh, even though black could live in the corner, uh, this massive capture would more than make up for it for white. So this is essentially a co-situation where white is risking nothing, black is risking everything, which is why in the game we don't even see black considering it. He just takes the stone off the board to make two eyes and live. So evaluate what you're getting when a co starts. Because in this case, if black were to try and fight this, it's a half point endgame co for black, whereas white's threatening to kill the entire black formation. Don't fight that kind of co. Back off. White Hane's in the center. Reducing things, more forcing moves, seals off the side. Now Black comes back and says, you know, are you sure this group is alive? I'm, I'm not convinced yet. You're going to have to show me. But White has a move prepared. And Black activates some of that corner Aji. That might have been a time suji. Um, and if you haven't heard the term time suji before, uh, suji is a Japanese word uh, that... Uh, in and of itself sort of means move or proper move, but uh, it's also the, the root of the word tesuji, which is a sort of a, a brilliant tactical play. And a time suji is, you know, if you're playing a game and you're running out of time, but you need a little bit, a few more seconds to think, you can play a forcing move, or essentially this would be a co-threat. You can play a co-threat to get yourself an extra Bayoyomi period to analyze the situation. So... And then black comes and plays this Hane over here. But white has planned for this. I think white had this all read out before uh, leaving this situation as is. So when black comes back here to take the corner and rob white of a base, white can play this sequence to connect and capture three stones. And now the game is really kind of over. This is actually, at this stage of the game, this six, seven, eight, maybe n nine or ten point capture is really big. And, uh, you know, black got some compensation on the edge by capturing the one stone, but now white stones are linked up, they're all really strong, there's no way to threaten them. That's a big reversal of fortune right there. Uh, black responds here because this move is threatening to capture these three stones. And then white comes back to block up here. And this is kind of an, an important, you know, you should not necessarily always respond immediately. This is a big double sente point at 018. For example, you know, white would absolutely love to play this and have black play here. Because after this, this Hane is also going to be sente. So if we compare this result here, you know, with, all right, white gets two points of territory here, two points here, so like four points over here. Black is pushed all the way back to getting territory on the R line. <clears throat> and then we go and we see how this goes in the game. And we realize here, just for the sake of seeing what it would look like immediately. So now we see that those, uh, those four points of territory that White was getting are gone. White's pushed all the way back to L. And now Black is getting... Um, four more points over here. This is eight points in double sente, which is huge. <laughs> that's a really massive, since it's sente for whoever plays it, that's basically like this sequence alone could determine 
the winning or losing of a game. It's bigger than Comey, and it's free for whoever plays it first. So, you know, just something to something to pay attention to. Black gets some Sente uh, reducing moves down here. And yeah, once this is forcing, because White has to come back and make sure this connection is working now. And here we have another big exchange. Uh, black threatens to pull these stones out, and White allows it. But at the same time, White is now threatening to come back here and take a big chunk out of Black's territory on the right side. So that's definitely a big exchange. And you know, if you want, uh, if you want to practice, you should analyze how big each of these moves was and see for yourself who came out on top. Like in this situation, when black plays this and threatens to connect, is it better for white to stop this or better for white to play as in the game and come here? And more importantly, what's the differential in how many points each player made? So, you know, here we're getting, you know, more forcing moves. Um, this is not quite as big as it looks because, you know, white can't block right here um, like you normally would in this situation. And this is a good, you know, don't make this mistake when there you only have, when you have a shortage of liberties with the black stone at d16. Don't play this. This is really bad. Um, there's this. And I guess, actually, in this situation, maybe something like this could happen. This actually wouldn't be that good for black because white could start a co here. But um, because of the shortage of liberties, da, 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 be better. I wonder if black could play something more aggressive. Anyway, there's something to keep in mind. So we just have forcing moves. Here we're kind of exchanging. Black's trying to damage the top. White's threatening to connect to the stone in the center here, which, notice, is probably going to kill this group. This black group is short of eyes now. And at this point, black realizes that this group is dead and resigns. And I'm not sure if there was a good way at what point. When white throws in here, that connects. It seems like at this point... Black can't actually afford to connect here, but has to play something like this to connect back to the corner, which lets white cut through. And this would be really terrible for black. There's not really any way to, you know, without getting at least a few points here. And, th and notice that this is even sente, because black has to connect here. White can, you know, come something out here. White's going to get some points in the center, you know. But white's been white's been leading for a while. I'm pretty sure. I didn't take the time to fully count out the the territories when I was prepping for this review. But uh, white has seemed to be doing very well through most of this game and handling the fights really well. And particularly this exchange down here, it seems that when white was able to swallow these stones, uh, it really was definitively over. But you know the professionals have to try. You know they're not going to give up without a fight. And that uh, fighting spirit is something we should emulate. But uh, yeah, I think this game was super interesting just, you know, in terms of looking at Joseki and evaluating it in the top left. And, and this is a really popular pattern now, so let's just go back and we'll look at some of the key elements here. I also really like this sequence on the bottom where White says, yeah, you know, you, you could attack that one stone. I'm going to make a framework over here. It's just a really, really neat style of play you know, to not put too much importance on any one stone. But yeah, this two space extension from this attachment after this one space low pincer on the high approach is really popular right now. And um, I see this I see this online in amateur games all the time. I see it in a ton of pro games right now. So this is if you're not familiar with this pattern and you're playing you're actively playing, you may want to brush up on it just a little bit. And just the way the sequence goes is that, you know, this move is sente. It's threatening to, you know, play at e17 and capture the a stone. So we know white has to do something. And now again, now this white slide to a is big, so black has to play there. And now, like I said, white would love to turn into the corner right now and rob black of a base, but it's not really robbing black of a base because this pincer at c is severe because there's the two stones at b15 and d15. So 
you know, white can't stop this. Like, black can either connect on the bottom or connect on the top. So white has to make the extension, and then black gets to take the corner. Which, again, after this move, if white plays somewhere else, like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm really just going to take this corner. This is super severe now. Like, this group is going to struggle for a long time because this stone is far, but it's got lots of friends over here. And this, these three stones are super, super weak. So, you know, basically white will jump out, black will come out uh, in some way to keep them separated, and we'll likely get stones to, um, at some point, come back and uh, counterattack somewhere around A or B at some point in the future if black is chasing this group, like, all over the board. So, we don't want that to happen. And, uh, yeah, so white extends. And then, uh, and then in the middle game fighting, looking at the crosscuts and analyzing the latter implications is just super important. And, you know, I think that sometimes people, like, they don't really, they're like, yeah, why, why are people, you know, why are the professionals, like, they're always talking about ladders. Why are these, like, you know, three, four Dawn players, you know, at my Go Club, like, they're always talking about ladders. They're like, oh, that variation won't work because of the ladder. And they come up all the time. It's just... It's really ridiculous. And like I said, not the actual ladder itself, but the threat of a ladder comes up all the time. And just, you know, we can just see any time that there's a crosscut, we have so many different potential ladders. Like, black can threaten this ladder on this stone here. He can threaten, you know, he can threaten the ladder going the other way on this stone. And actually, if I just move these a little bit to the side, what would be a good, uh, a good example here? From here up over. Yeah. Let's do maybe this one. Uh, this is kind of an important concept, because we can actually threaten this stone in two different ways. Um, we can threaten to capture it in this ladder right here, starting from N13. And we can threaten to capture it in this ladder here, uh, starting at, um, what is this, M. And so we notice that if we were to play this ladder out, like let's say white says, okay, I, I actually I'm going to do something over here because it's important, and we play this ladder, we see immediately that this ladder is working. It's going straight into the black stones. But if we start with the other ladder, white does something over here, and we try to play this one out. And actually, with the black stone right here, maybe this example's not working. Um, because, okay, right. If we imagine that this black stone was not actually here, because in this case, um, black has a... Oh, no, 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 this, this is working. This is working. I'm confusing myself. Black plays here, white plays here, which is an Atari. So one of our two ladders isn't working. So this is just kind of a subtle difference, but, you know, we, we have options. And if we weren't reading ladders and we thought, oh, I'll extend here because I want this stone more, white could potentially ignore this, you know, because <clears throat> this ladder isn't working. So if we wanted our move to be sente, in this situation, this move is not sente in terms of attacking the stone. But this move is sente in terms of attacking the stone. And you would only know that if you read ladders. So the difference between Sente and Gote is pretty big in Go, and this is why reading ladders is important, because if we don't read ladders, we won't know these things, and these are very important concepts to be on top of in the middle of a game. So that's it for this time, uh, and uh, thank you for watching.